Um, hi, everyone. My name is Matt Stapleton. Like, uh, like what, what has been said before, I'm from the University of Central Florida. I have my email listed. Um, today, I'm going to be talking to you about ancient Egyptian culture as a neutral commodity on non-Western non movie franchises. Um, it's a bit of a misnomer, I recognize. Um, it is in Western movie franchises, but it's in Western movie franchises that are marketed towards non-Western audiences. So um, during this discussion, I'm going to be talking about uh, ancient Egyptian influences in internationally distributed movies. Um, the two that I'm going to be focused on mainly are Transformers Revenge of the Fallen, which I believe another one of our, uh, um, not in this panel, but a different panelist is also covering. Um, and then I'm also going to be discussing X-Men Apocalypse, which I think is the same way. Um, and then Gods of Egypt and the Mummy are going to be discussed much later in this discussion, mostly just involving the financial impact that they have. Um, I'm going to be looking at soft power in international cultural and uh, financial relationships. Um, as this theme sort of revolves around Egypt, I'm going to be mostly talking about Egypt and how it relates to uh, other countries. But in this case, specifically, I'm going to be talking about Egypt and China. And then uh, Egypt does serve as a non-Western focus in a lot of movies, especially because of its mythology. So I'm going to be talking about how that sort of relates directly into how it can be used financially. Um, to sort of start things off, just to kick it off, uh, I'm going to be talking about Revenge of the Fallen. Um, if anyone doesn't know, this is a Transformers movie by Michael Bay from 2009. Um, it was one of the more popular ones. Um, it involved a lot of sort of bouncing around locations because they had some sort of strange teleporting technology. Um, it starred Shia LaBeouf as uh, Sam Witwicky. Um, in this case, I'm showing off some of the initial images I want to. Um, first of all, on your left, you see Sam Witwicky kind of posing in front of a Great Pyramid of Giza, that sort of doing anything with it. And then the Cybertronian jet fire um, is the reason they go to Egypt. Uh, he allows them to teleport there and then proceeds to sacrifice himself. Um, going on, the Transformers uh, series sort of then looks into fighting in Egypt. Um, they decide to use science fiction pretty heavily in the discussion of Egypt. Um, it turns out the pyramids were put there by ancient Cybertronians, um, which are the race of Autobots and Decepticons, if you don't know, the, the robot people. Um, in this case, uh, a group of robots that are all mining equipment turn into a uh, Decepticon called Devastator. Um, he tears open one of the great periods of Giza and reveals some sort of sun harvester. Um, the whole point is to try to absorb the sun um, and pull it to Earth and then open a portal to Cyber, uh, Cybertron, which is the home planet of the Decepticons and Autocon Autobots. Um, so strangely enough, uh, it just sort of puts science fiction into Egypt without really thinking hard about it. Um, You'll also see some discussion about Optimus Prime being in there. Um, the overall result of how Transformers approaches uh, science fiction in Egypt, um, it really wants to display humanity as this species that has been influenced by an even more ancient power. Um, I believe this is the one that introduces the concept that these Transformers had arrived to Earth in a uh, much, much, much uh, longer before we had. Um, there, It followed upon in recent movies as well. Um, in Transformers 3 and 4, uh, they like to have strange alien artifacts placed around the world. And in this case, the, uh, um, a, the artifacts are placed specifically into Egypt. Um, like I mentioned, the uh, pyramids are serving as some strange structure that wants to absorb our sun to allow Cybertron to come here. Um, I think the best way to describe this and is a theme that you're going to see in a lot of different movies that use Egypt is that um, they like to use Egypt solely as a playground. Um, I like to use that term because uh, it, it literally is what they're doing. Um, the action sequences like to focus on Egypt. Uh, you'll see Transformers and Autobot, you know, different Autobots running around in Egypt. Um, there's not, not really much of a discussion of culture. And if there is, it's in the sense of what Transformers 2 does, where they take a giant pyramid and they turn it into something else. Um, but they basically just use it as a backdrop to their fighting, um, hence the playground idea. Um, it's important to note that Transformers 2 grossed $204 million US dollars domestically um, and then was able to do $434 million internationally as well. Um, of those $434 million internationally, uh, China was the largest foreign market uh, with a full $65 million. Um, as you'll see as we discuss throughout this, rant, throughout this uh, discussion, um, the, this number actually starts to improve a lot and I'll sort of figure that out why later. Um, Importantly, it did set up the Transformers franchise for growing market success, um, specifically in Transformers 4, as Ann Kokos points out. Um, the, uh, the utilization of Egyptian culture allows 
transformers to pull into a Chinese audience. Um, the concept that they are trying to work specifically with them. And in Transformers 4, you'll see scenes specifically in Hong Kong, which allows um, Chinese audiences a much more at-home approach, um, but also keeps the playground uh, model that Transformers 2 is set up with Egypt. Um, the next film I'd like to discuss as well in this sense is X-Men Apocalypse. Um, it's a very similar theme where they'll be using, uh, in this case, Cairo specifically, but Egypt as a whole as a playground. Um, uh, for those who don't know, X-Men is a series about mutants um, who engage in a number of superhero battles. Um, previously in the comics, uh, X-Men is more about um, the racial dynamics of um, a group of people being sort of uh, looked down upon by another group of people. X-Men Apocalypse sort of makes it more of a mutant versus mutant thing without really paying too much heed to the racial components of it. Um, the most important character that gives us a tie to Egypt beyond the playground is Ena Saba Nur, um, or Apocalypse, who's played by Oscar Isaac, a very good actor. Um, he's an immortal mutant. He is somewhat implied to have built the entirety of ancient Egypt, being immortal and being all powerful. Um, he puts together pyramids. As you can see, there's some runic glyphs that are on the pyramids as well um, that are directly related to Apocalypse. Um, he is sort of he's sort of like the main character in this film, uh, even though he's a an antagonist, um, he does involve the entire plot um, and, and it does follow him from ancient Egypt to the modern times. Um, you can see in the top right panel, he is sitting in a place where they were going to uh, mummify him um, in some way. But in this case, what they're doing with mummification is transferring his consciousness from an older body to a newer body. Um, but then they do actually mummify him and trap him for uh, thousands of years um, until the modern day where he awakens to a new and improved Cairo in Egypt in a modern society uh, and decides that he would like to take it over again um, in a very similar fashion to how he took over the ancient uh, Egypt. Um, we are also introduced to a new version of Storm. Um, while the X-Men series previously cast Halle Berry as Storm, uh, Alexandra Ship is instead put in there. Um, she's a Cairo-born mutant with rather controlled powers, while Halle Berry's character is much less focused on that. Uh, this version of Storm does focus more on the previous roots that X-Men had established in the comics. Um, like I mentioned, she's Cairo born, which plays into the fact that that is where Apocalypse has woken up. Um, she's a thief uh, who has her mutant powers awoken by Apocalypse. Um, it, that's a very important distinction because uh, in the um, original X-Men series, uh, film series, they don't really focus on this too much of her origin. But in this case, they actually have a tie to Egypt. Um, and while um, Apocalypse is not specifically designed to be Egyptian um, in this case, uh, even though he's discussed in a lot of Egyptian life. Um, Storm is an Egyptian resident. Um, she is from Cairo, um, lived and born there, um, although the comics have a very different take on that. Uh, regardless, the um, Storm that we're introduced to in this film series is much more Egyptian and has a lot more ties to the culture and the roots, um, hence why uh, she feels at home uh, working with Apocalypse in Egypt and wanting to take it over for most of the film, although she does turn into her traditional protagonist role at the end. Um, once again, we see an Egyptian style villain. Um, and in this case, the Egyptian style villain is trying to take over the world, um, although he's using Egypt as the basis for it. Um, Cairo once again serves as a playground of sorts. Um, this case, in this case, it's only during the major action sequences that it serves as a playground though. Um, during those scenes specifically, we see that the traditional um, and ancient Egyptian culture don't really play any role uh, in how the mutants fight with one another. But um, this movie actually does play some reference to current modern uh, Egyptian culture and also has at least some discussion of ancient Egyptian culture. Um, this one only grossed 155 million domestically. I say only, but that's in comparison to the international um, where it grossed $388 million internationally. Um, in this case, the Chinese foreign market was at $120 million, um, which almost catches up to the domestic amount. Um, interestingly enough, um, and this is a discussion a lot of film scholars will discuss uh, and look at and say that when you compare uh, older movies to more recent movies, the Chinese audience of moviegoers has actually grown. And so it's not often not a fair comparison. In this case, the subsequent titles, Logan and X-Men Dark Phoenix, which came out in 2017 and 2019, actually perform uh, less well in China than X-Men Apocalypse. Um, I think a lot of that is due to the Egyptian focus um, and the focus on something that isn't Western, um, which is something that we'll see in a little bit of future discussion. So if it wasn't obvious, China is sort of the main focus for a lot of these Egyptian culture films. Um, the 
interesting thing that I was able to find as I researched this was that a lot of Greco-Roman mythology films um, did not receive openings in China. Um, Nordic mythology does receive openings in China, but that's mostly because of Thor, who really skews the series, the Marvel's Thor series, which is internationally, you know, part of that Marvel Avengers series. Um, however, traditional Greco-Roman mythology does not receive um, any sort of uh, opening release in China and often won't even have uh, numbers published because of it. Um, as I mentioned uh, in previous annotations, uh, all these numbers are drawn from Box Office Mojo, which actually does not list any sort of Chinese opening for uh, some of the films that I've listed. Um, in this case, the 300 series, Percy Jackson series, Class of Titan series, and The Immortals, uh, which is a standalone uh, Greco-Roman film. Um, however, Wonder Woman does buck the trend. Um, this might be because she's a superhero and published by DC, which is a uh, already has a strong audience in China. Um, in addition to that, uh, I'm also looking at two additional films. Um, these ones I'm not going to analyze quite so heavily because they don't really follow the theme we had of science fiction. Um, but Gods of Egypt was only able to gross $31 million domestically, domestically being in the US, but $35 million in China. Um, and then The Mummy uh, only grossed $80 million domestically. Uh, this is the one with Tom Cruise and $91 million in China. Um, these are actually very important distinctions because most often the international market um, no single player in the international market is able to gross more than the United States if it's a um, United States produced and uh, centered film. Um, in this case, we see that both uh, Gods of Egypt and The Mummy have Egyptian themes um, and are able to be released in China to a much greater success than in the United States. Um, I think there's a number of reasons for that, but one of the most important things is soft power. Um, soft power is very different than hard power, which is more military power, but soft power is positive reinforcement and attraction. Um, the concept that a lot of people use when they describe soft power is panda diplomacy. Um, and this applies to international zoos as well, but is typically referred to with San Francisco. Um, but China will often lend pandas out to American zoos um, due to their cultural and financial pull. Um, so often, these zoos will be stronger because they have a panda um, and will attract much more money and income. Um, so China is able to lend out these pandas in sort of a, a lease program. Um, and what that does is they're allowed to sort of encourage Chinese business growth in that region. Um, Egypt is very, um, is very useful in a soft power perspective. Um, they're able to leverage quite a lot of soft power over other uh, countries because of the film industry um, and because of tourism as well, but mostly because of the film industry currently. Um, the soft power is often filmed through cultural landmarks such as the pyramid and the sphinx. Um, discussions of ancient mummies as well um, will often be seen in movies, um, which often will involve some sort of Egyptian influence and Egyptian uh, say. Um, the government will often uh, play a role in, in setting up these uh, individuals in Western um, countries to come over and film in their, uh, in their country. Um, so soft power is sort of a sense of cultural security where um, it's the boosting of one's own positive stance in the international frame or stage. Uh, and in this case, you can see that uh, in Egypt where um, cultures are shown and distributed through Egypt uh, and will um, do better because they are shown uh, and because other people see that and want to also film there. Uh, in the case of China as well, um, some places and some film industries will actually go in and have specific benefits and rules that they can have if they film in that location. Egypt follows this policy as well, where if you use the pyramids, there's a, um, a nice little bonus that they get um, within the advertising and, and marketing um, financial aspect where they receive a, cup, uh, a cut of the film. Um, additionally, it promotes a uh, citizen-based development of these relationships, uh, which is a much stronger relationship than if two countries were solely being met by their leaders, um, as in the case with uh, many countries currently, um, especially in the Middle, uh, Middle East and in uh, Asia. Um, importantly to China, um, and especially with these science fiction movies that we're looking at, um, China really depends on Egypt for its European trade, uh, especially with the Suez Canal. I know we've, a lot of us have heard about the Suez Canal this year because of the Ever Given. Um, the Ever Given was a south to north boat, um, which is important only in that I'm going to be discussing north and south trade and south and north trade and sort of trying to distinguish that. Um, China depends on Egypt uh, to give them access to the Suez Canal and, and uh, benefits for using the Suez Canal. Um, and additionally, a 2019 or 2010 economic study found that Egypt was actually under trading with China. Um, what that means is that Egypt wasn't actually trading quite as much uh, capital with China as China was trading with it. Um, this is the country as a whole. 
put the uh, destinations of north to south trade, which would be um, from European and other countries going through the Suez Canal south. Um, they're mostly transported to the Red Sea, which is what the Suez Canal feeds directly into. But then the Far East and the Southeast Asia um, regions, as designated by the Suez Canal, uh, uh, people, um, there's not really a better way to say that, um, uh, those are the regions that are also uh, traded quite heavily, um, with the Red Sea being the most. By contrast, um, mostly uh, the trade from uh, south to north, which is uh, places from the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean trading into Europe, um, will often come from Southeast Asia, with it being the top. Um, additionally, uh, the South China Post in a 2019 article has discussed that China has actually invested billions into Egyptian projects, which includes levels of the Suez Canal. So there's actually an encouragement of these science fiction films that look at Asia, uh, look at uh, Egypt to sort of focus on the um, the usefulness of uh, the Suez Canal and for China to want to have a positive relationship with them. Um, as you can see, these are the cargo tons um, used, uh, and Southeast Asia is a predominant factor in both of these, specifically the North South traffic origin, um, which implies the uh, original location, as you can see, Southeast Asia, which includes China, includes a huge amount of the trade uh, by ton. Um, so further reading for this, uh, in addition to what I've talked about here, um, first of all, the other people's videos um, in this uh, conference do a really good job of describing some of the films that I've been discussing as well. Um, a deeper dive on uh, X-Men Apocalypse can be found in one of those. Um, blanking on the name currently because I'm a little nervous, but that's how it goes. Um, some of the things that I've been working on, uh, these are some of the further readings. Uh, Hatab um, and et al. Uh, exploring Egypt to China bilateral trade is where I found a lot of the information regarding the Suez Canal being used in the majority of these projects. Um, and Cocos is where I sort of discovered the concept of soft power, which is expanded upon in an earlier article by Joseph Nye. Um, and then finally, the monstrously feminine Orientalism embodied in 2017's The Mummy. Um, while I wasn't able to directly use that in this discussion, uh, it did allow me to uh, form a basis of seeing Orientalism and the concept of Chinese uh, values in Egyptian focused movies. Um, obviously, The Mummy is not as much a science fiction film as the rest of these, but um, still does a very good job of, of displaying Chinese values. Um, that is about it for me. Um, thank you so much for being here for my discussion and presentation. Um, this is something I'd like to further expand upon as well uh, in discussion, if need be, uh, in questions. But thank you so much for uh, letting me be here.